Uh, we're looking at enzymes, right? We're looking at how enzymes work. Enzymes, they work for catalyzing or enhancing the rate of a reaction. Okay, that's what enzymes do. Now, one particular uh, way they do it is by stabilizing something. Okay? Now, what we see is unreacted, okay, no enzyme, two theoretical enzymes. One is the enzyme binding to the substrate, and then the other is enzyme binding to the transition state. Okay? And then remember we discussed how if the enzyme was to bind to the substrate, you stabilize the substrate. So if you look at the energy diagram, initially the energy for the substrate is like right here, but then you stabilize the substrate by forming an enzyme substrate complex. Then this thing is more stable, so it has lower energy. Lower energy meaning more stable, right? And then, you know, it's not doing anything, right? Because if you want to go to the product, then you actually have to give it a lot more activation energy than what you initially had. Okay, so bad. This guy is bad. Okay, it's just bad, right? So it turns out most enzymes, what they do is they work by binding to the transition state. Okay? They work as a way to stabilize the transition state. Okay? So what you do is you stabilize the transition state such that you lower the energy gap or the energy barrier, we say, the energy barrier between the substrate and the transition state. Okay? And then this decrease, okay, so the, the amount where you go from the transition state initial, the transition state uncatalyzed, to the transition state catalyzed, this dropping energy provides you the enhancement in rate. Enzyme reaction properties, all right, just remember, uh, again, enzymes are catalysts, okay, so it only changes the rate of the reaction, it does not change the direction of the reaction. Direction of the reaction is determined by the thermodynamics of that reaction. Okay, so please just, you know, memorize that. Um, enzymes, they work by lowering the activation energy, okay, from both direction of the reaction. Okay, so what you see is, for example, here, by dropping the transition state energy, okay, so this is the activation energy, you essentially lower the activation energy from the substrate and from the product. Okay, so enzyme can speed up both directions, okay, because the activation energy is dropped. So it works for both directions, from the substrate and from the product. Okay, so again, it just reinforces the idea that you know the direction of the reaction is not changed. Okay, you essentially just lower the energy barrier for the reaction, and then the reaction can go forward or reverse. So enzymes accelerate reaction rate of both forward and the reverse reaction. Now, essentially what enzymes do is they accelerate reaction towards equilibrium. Right? So um, the idea is that what you want to do in all chemical reaction is they are working towards equilibrium, okay? towards the state that is very stable for everybody. Okay? So, Remember that at equilibrium, delta G is zero, so if delta G is zero, you have no net energy for anything, right? It's, it's, it's just equilibrium, okay? So enzymes do not change equilibrium, right? Like I said, equilibrium is determined by the nature of the reaction, okay? Which guy is more stable, right? You always go from more reactive to more stable, okay? So what we say is that we have a delta of delta G star, uh, sorry, delta, delta G naught double dagger. And essentially what it is is just the difference between the activation energy of the uncatalyzed minus the catalyzed. Okay? So this sort of determines our rate 
enhancement, right? Because what this is referring to is this, okay? That's what that is, all right? So that's the change in energy for the transition state. The more energy you save, then the faster the enzyme rate. If you look at the relationship between transition state stabilization and the rate enhancement, what you see is that if you drop the energy by about 24 kilojoule per mole, you enhance the rate by 10 to the fourth power. Um, so the more energy you save, okay, you know, the, let's say you have uncatalyzed, catalyzed, okay, so larger this band, the larger this energy gap, then the rate enhancement gets larger. Okay, so it depends on how your enzyme is stabilizing the transition state. Okay, now different enzymes have different properties. Okay, some enzymes can stabilize it better. Okay, um, we'll talk about some of the ways that enzyme uh, can stabilize the transition state. Okay, so some of the ways that enzymes uh, catalyze reactions. Okay. Now, always remember that the delta G double dagger for catalyzed will always be lower than the delta G of the uncatalyzed, right? That, ma that makes, that, that, that's just by definition, okay? Catalyzed, meaning it, spe it speeds up, right? So um, with a catalyst, you always have a lower activation energy, okay? So that's just very, very simple, All right? So very quickly, we're going to look at... Um, one of the most important aspects of enzyme, remember throughout our class, I keep on emphasizing on the fact that um, all biological molecules, uh, they have a three-dimensional shape, okay? Shape is super important for biochemistry, okay? actually for chemistry in general, shape, okay? So enzymes, we know, uh, we've talked about like alpha helix, beta, xi, and all that stuff. Uh, we know that enzymes have shapes and then substrate have shapes, and then the interaction between enzyme and substrate, sort of, that's one of the uh, major aspect of your catalysis. Okay, now, here we have uh, two hypotheses or two models in a way. Uh, we have the lock and key and the induced fit. Now, lock and key in the end of uh, the 19th century essentially says enzyme is a lock and substrate is a key. So it's like, um, enzyme sits there and substrate comes in, okay? And what this model sort of explains is the specificity of the enzyme, okay? Meaning that, let's say you have an enzyme and then the substrate is a key and then it'll fit right in, okay? So this explains the specificity of the enzyme, okay? We know that Enzymes are pretty specific to what kind of chemicals they react, right? So what this guy explains is how they bind. However, lock and key hypothesis does not explain the actual catalysis. It just says, yeah, enzyme has a preference for its substrate. It doesn't bind other things. Sure, okay? It's a very specific catalyst. It just says the shape, okay? So if you look at um, the diagram and on the left here, this guy, okay? So essentially what lock and key model says is that enzyme and substrate, so when substrate has a shape, an enzyme is gonna have a complementary shape so that only this substrate can bind onto this enzyme and form this ES complex. And then somehow magically you catalyze the reaction and then you cut the substrate in half and generate P1 and P2, okay? Now, this model, good for saying enzymes are specific. However, it does not tell you what happens here, okay? It doesn't tell you what happens there, like magic. So that's not exactly right. So about half a century later, uh, we got this other theory called the induced fit hypothesis, which is a lot better, okay? And the induced fit hypothesis says that both enzyme and substrate are distorted to fit the transition state. 
Okay, so from what we discussed on the previous slide, this sounds like it makes more sense. Okay, so what what does that mean, right? Okay, so turns out, okay, turns out, before they bind, enzyme has a shape. Okay, substrate has a shape. Okay, and the shape do not match like 100%. Okay, so they sort of match in a way that they bind, right? And after they bind, you have a distortion of the enzyme and the substrate simultaneously, such that you reach the transition state, okay? So the real shape of the ES complex is the transition state shape, not the, you know, pre-binding shape, right? Once you get to the transition state, then you can have a reaction to cut off the e, uh, of the of the substrate into the two products, and then the enzyme regenerate what it's supposed to look like. Okay, so the induced fit model sort of has a uh, better understanding at you know the real catalysis process. Okay, so enzyme undergoes a specific distortion or shape change to then combine enzyme and the substrate together they become the activation uh, sorry the transition state shape does that is that are we okay okay so enzyme actually changes shape a little bit so the enzyme is changed in the process it's just that after the process after the catalysis enzyme return to the original shape during the process, enzyme actually changes. Okay, so that's an important concept. During the process, enzyme will change. Okay, maybe residue. Well, you actually have chemistry between the substrate and the enzyme, uh, or you just have conformational change, whatever. So during the catalysis process, the enzyme is changed. Okay either in conformation or chemically, whatever. Enzyme is changed, okay? It's just that after the process, after the catalysis, enzyme returns to the original shape. So this is true even in chemical catalysis, okay? Um, for the biotechnology major, you guys, unfortunately, you don't get to take a class called catalysis or inorganic chemistry. If you go and take inorganic chemistry, you will learn a lot about metal catalysts. Okay? Metal catalysts, when it's doing catalysis, it actually forms chemical bond with whatever substrate that you're reacting with. Okay? So during the catalysis process, you do have chemical interaction. Right? So judging from that, we know the lock and key model is insufficient. Okay? So the induced fit model makes more sense. All right. So here you have um, a enzyme that binds to glucose, or actually a catalyzed reaction with glucose. And what you can see is that before glucose binding, it looks one way. After glucose binding, you see how you have a, you have a shape distortion or a conformational change such that you then with the glucose bound inside, you have a shape change that brings it to the transition state. Of course, this thing is theoretical. It is very difficult to get the transition state shape using experiment because transition state is very fast. Right? Unless you use a transition state analog, which cannot be reacted, but transition state analog, of course, it's still an analog. It's never the true transition state. So the real shape, it's always very difficult to get. Now, a couple of things. So if we look at the catalysis itself, we know that it's going to lower the delta G, so the delta G of your transition state, so the activation energy. So essentially, how do we do it? For any delta G, we can split it into delta H and delta S. And then we're going to look at delta H and delta S. 
The delta H, the change in enthalpy, is essentially how the enzyme stabilizes the transition state through things like electrostatic interaction, van der Waals interaction, whatever. So things that you can use to stabilize the energy of the transition state. We'll see an example today. Okay, how do you how do you sort of increase delta S or, or in a way you make delta S preferable? And essentially what that is looking at is how the enzyme will direct the substrate to the preferred orientation. Okay, so remember we said that rate of the reaction determines on the orientation of the molecule. Right? So in this case, enzyme is very useful because enzyme has a specific shape. And when the substrate comes in, right, if the substrate can bind to the enzyme, then it's going to be in the direction that it's supposed to be in. Okay, so delta S is then made preferred. Right, so what you have is, let's look at the figure on the right, and we're going to go over the entire process. Right, you have the catalyst, and what you see is that the catalyst will separately bind your substrate 1, substrate 2, and when substrate 1 and substrate 2 binds, what you have is proximity and orientation. That means is that the orientation of the two molecule is correct. Proximity, meaning the distance between the two molecule, is okay. So you solved orientation and distance when they bind. Okay, just simple binding. You solve two problems. And then proximity and orientation favors the formation of the transition state. In this case, the delta S for the catalyzed is going to be greater than the delta S of the uncatalyzed. And then here is binding. After the bind, then you have chemical changes. You're going to have strong binding of the transition state. So at the transition state, you will have, number one, very good binding. So at the, the second step right there, it's to stay bind, but the binding is not super good, right? You think about the magnet example. When you go to the transition state, it's like a super good binding, right? Super good. And what do I mean by super good binding? You have electrostatic interactions, okay? Maybe you have charge-charge interaction. Maybe you have polar interactions. Maybe you have... What else? Van der Waals, hydrophobic, okay? So you have all, all those stabilizing interactions that help you to stabilize your transition state, okay? In that case, right, in that case, what you have is a lowered delta H. Remember, lower delta H, you want lower delta H, right? Delta H you want to be negative, okay? So you have a delta H that's more negative than the delta H that's uncatalyzed. Then, after doing that, so then what you have is a reaction occurring somewhere here, and then you got the product. The product is this. So you see how enzyme binding essentially favors the formation of the transition state. That is because enzyme has a very specific shape the molecules no longer have to rotate and bump into each other like crazy. They can come in, sit at the enzyme with the preferable distance and orientation. In this case, you don't have to waste energy and then like rotate. And then when they get close enough, you have reaction. And then reaction, transition state, is stabilized by the enzyme through electrostatics, through uh, hydrogen bonds through polar-polar interaction, things like that. Right? So just remember, the ultimate goal for catalysis is to reduce the activation energy. Okay? And then there are many, many ways that we can uh, reduce it.